The Cho Oyu is a majestic mountain found in the Nepalese Himalayas, among the many other tall peaks. With a summit elevation of 8,188 meters, it ranks as the sixth tallest mountain globally. It is just 14 summits over that height on the entire planet. These so-called 8,000 ERs are very well liked by mountaineers, since climbing any of these formidable peaks carries a particular reputation and is not a simple undertaking. With a very mild slope and a clear path to the summit, the Cho Oyu is the easiest of the 8,000 mountains to climb. And as a result, it is very well liked for guided trips, with the Cho Oyu being the second most climbed mountain, behind only Mount Everest at 8,000 meters. And while being the easiest of the 8,000 mountains on Earth, the peak nonetheless poses many risks to intrepid climbers who want to reach its summit. A small expedition crew arrived at the Cho Oyu Advanced Northwest Base Camp on April 15, 2000. The nine-person party included both Russians and Finns, with the Russians serving as the expedition's leaders because they were the group's most seasoned mountaineers. They intended to make three camps along the way at 6,400 meters, 700 meters, and 7,400 meters as they planned to ascend the mountain's northwest face conventionally. At the advanced base camp, they joined two other expedition parties, a Korean and Iranian teams, a Korean and Iranian teams. The nine-person team immediately began climbing the mountain setting up camp and acclimatizing to the altitude after seeing that the other teams had already started to plan their pass for summit attempts. The climbers began moving equipment from the advanced base camp to Camp 1 on April 17, as the Sherpas from the Korean and Iranian teams worked on establishing the boundary between Camp 1 and Camp 2. The party returned to base camp to wait out the blizzard and get some rest but on April 20, their progress was delayed due to terrible weather. After the weather improved a little on April 21st, the group decided to move supplies to Camp 1 and, if the conditions persisted favorably, attempt to reach Camp 2. Climbers must negotiate an icefall and a 200-meter-long treacherous, treacherous ice sheet to get to Camp 2, located between Camps 1 and 2. The group opted to take the following few days to relax and acclimate because, by this time, several climbers had started to develop altitude sickness. This much-needed respite had re-energized the party. On April 27, they arrived at Camp 2, where they began gathering supplies and making plans for their push-up to Camp 3, located at 7,400 meters. On May 2, they took the following few days off to rest. The group's three most seasoned Russian climbers arrived at Camp 3 and put up their tents, but the weather suddenly turned bad. They remembered how the powerful gusts nearly lifted them off the ground as they returned to Pace's camp. But shortly after, the poor weather seemed to clear. With this fresh weather window opening, the rest of the group decided to go on toward Camp 3, and if the weather held, perhaps even the summit. Pavel Bona Tokiko, a 38-year-old Russian who had missed the last push with the other Russians to Camp 3 due to altitude sickness, led this effort. The expedition's team leader, a 50-year-old male named Dwa, and a 25-year-old named Nora Tonin, trailed Pavel closely before joining him at Camp 3 on May 14. The weather was clear on May 5 morning, and Pav and Nora, feeling energized and fresh, decided to seize the chance to push for the summit. Jama declined to join them since he needed to rest because he was worn out. Even though the sun was beaming that morning, the temperature dropped to roughly negative 40 degrees as the wind whipped the climbers. So, at 5.30 a.m., the two left and started climbing the last leg of the summit route. They expected the trip to take between 10 and 12 hours and scheduled to return to Camp 3 before sundown. At around 12.15 p.m., Base Camp made radio contact with Nora to see how they were doing in their attempt to reach the summit. Nora retorted, If you stomp, it's chilly. Otherwise, it's alright. Base Camp warned the two that the weather was starting to turn bad again as a storm approached and that they would need to move quickly to reach the summit that day. 
Observers at base camp saw Pavel and Nora coming to the summit about an hour after communicating with Nora via radio. However, they were still about two hours away from the actual peak and about 90 minutes from the foot of the summit plateau. This left them well behind schedule after continuing to climb across a several hundred meter long open snowy plateau. They were supposed to have reached the summit around the time they made radio contact with base camp as per their, as per their preparations. Soon after, they lost sight of the couple once more as the bad weather system moved swiftly toward the Cho'oyo mountainside, and by 5 p.m. the store had enveloped entirely the mountain's upper half. The weather had become a severe snowstorm, and Jva's tent was battered by strong winds back at Camp 3. He expected the couple to have returned by this time, and he started to worry about them. As the minutes went by, the rest of the gang began to worry more and more about Nora and Pavel, and they also started to fear the worst. At approximately 7 o'clock in the evening, Nora's voice could be heard over the radio. Does anyone hear? She asked as a loud static crackle interrupted her. They desperately tried to re-establish radio communication, but could never get in touch with the couple again. Throughout the night, Jama kept flashing his headlights into the pitch black area outside his tent to serve as a beacon for the wandering climbers. However, the team was aware that the two would have perished by this point if they hadn't heard from Nora on Perseverance by May 6. It was virtually inconceivable that they were still alive at this time, given the extreme cold on the mountain and the altitude. The bad weather persisted over the following few days as the group discussed their options. On May 8, the weather finally cleared up again. The Russian group, relaxing at base camp during the tragic summit, decided to push for the summit on their own while searching for Nora and Pavel along the way. It was unclear what had happened to them, so they wanted to find signs of them. A brief memorial service for the two was held on May 10 at base camp. On the 11th, the Korean crew arrived at the summit and reported that they had discovered footprints leading from the solid top to its southern flank where they suddenly lost track. The three other expedition members made it to the peak without incident. Still, they could not spot Pavel or Nora anywhere along the way. The parrot seems to have walked off the southern edge of the top and fallen down the Shia rock face below into Nepal, according to an inquiry conducted after the tragedy. According to the study, the climbers were probably running behind schedule that day because they didn't give themselves enough time to acclimatize. They also appeared to have pushed themselves too hard and fast. Even short distances become incredibly challenging to travel at such elevations, and the pair hadn't been utilizing an additional oxygen. Around 8,000 meters when the body is struggling to keep up, the oxygen pressure in the air is so low that even acclimatized, resting humans cannot keep their body going for more than a few days. At most, climbers over 8,000 meters are similarly impaired by this lower oxygen level. Many climbers make poor, impulsive decisions due to oxygen deprivation, affecting their motor skills and even resulting in vivid hallucinations. This handicap most certainly contributed to the deaths of Pavel Ban Tokiko and Nira Tonin. The more seasoned Russian climbers who had guided the expedition observed that the Finns and Pavel had independently opted to change their intended course of descent, and it was generally agreed that it was ultimately up to each own individual's decision whether they opted to attempt to reach the summit or not, since everyone had paid quite a lot of their own money to join the expedition. According to the brushing climbers, this incident may have been completely prevented if the group had followed them as they had intended and hadn't hurried to the summit with summit fever during such a risky weather window.